The Gang of Thugs is here to take on a movie currently in theaters and spoil it rotten. And this month, we're taking the stage with the Tatum behind his third run as his spiritual alter ego, Mike Lane, in Steven Soderbergh's latest return from retirement, Magic Mike's Last Dance. What did you want before Miami? I just wanted to escape my life. I need you. Do you like bartending? It's not really what I do. What is it that you really do? But then you came along and gave me this unexpected, magical moment that made me remember who I really was. with me to London. Let's go. So let's dance. Let's dance. Why are you in London? I'm gonna put on a show at this famous theater. People are numb, disconnected. We're gonna wake them up with a wave of passion they've never felt before. Hell yeah. Without further ado, I give you the visionary artist, Magic Mind. So. The real question is, why do you love her? No one's believed in me like your mom has. So what's this show about? It's the same old, will she marry for love or money? So what does she pick, love or money? The real question is, why does she feel like she has to choose? It sounds to me that she just needs to let go. And some good. Maybe that as well. Welcome, everybody. Grab a plumber and a ballerina because this is Channing Tatum's <laughs> magnum opus. And this time we get the story all the way from gold blimey London. I'm Pete Wright, and I'm joined round the pole by Steve Sarmento. So, <laughs> <laughs> Justin J.J. Yeager. Hello, hello. Happy to be here dancing. And Tommy Met. <laughs> I've heard that what song is, more this week than I've ever heard. Pony? It was, was supposed to be Pony. <laughs> <laughs> oh you guys i you know what i i want to talk about we we haven't we've never done a magic mic on any of the next real shows we've never done a magic really? mic that's a tragedy. i know i'm as tragedy. shocked as you are I, I think it is a tragedy a tragedy 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 I heard you. nobody knows what that word is boing, uh, boing. and so <laughs> i i want to at least start as we set up this conversation with your experience with the magic mike cinematic universe magic mike and of course magic mike xxl where do you all stand with the magic's mike jj well soderbergh is generally my favorite director when we when we talk about a director that i pretty much like his work all, or, or all of the director's work it's steven soderbergh so mm -hmm. i when i was first introduced to when i was introduced to the first magic mic i was very pleasantly surprised i remember when it when it was coming out the subject matter everything i was like oh this is soderbergh but i don't know if i'm gonna like it and then i loved it i thought it was a really wonderful subculture tale that made for some epic human relationships and it was wildly entertaining I loved it. And then I didn't see XXL because maybe I brought some of those preconceived notions to, you know, to that movie too. I did see it leading up to this, this movie this week. And mm -hmm. I really loved XXL as well for completely different reasons. Mm -hmm. um, I yeah. enjoyed it in all different kinds of ways. And so I got really excited about the franchise, which is, I think, ultimately your question here, because it felt like there are different movies about the same subject matter that were really entertaining. And so, um, so I got really excited and my expectations got a little high for this particular last dance movie. Ooh, so ooh, he's, he's teasing it out there. Steve, what uh, do you think? Where uh, are you on magic? Uh, I'm a similar place mostly as JJ. I saw the first one and because again, Soderbergh and was really impressed with how, uh, the, 
It was an interesting story within a setting that we just normally don't get. And I thought this is an interesting character piece. I, on rewatching it, prepping for this, I realized I think one of the problems with that is you sort of have this like dual protagonist type of thing trying to, to balance itself out. It's called Magic Mike. But we really start off with the Alex Pettifer character who, you know, then disappears, but he's sort of our audience surrogate. And so it, it felt mm -hmm. a little clunky in some parts, trying to balance those things out. I had not seen Magic Mike XXL, I think probably because Soderbergh didn't direct that one. So I wasn't sure if the franchise was branching off to become its own separate thing. So I did watch still a producer, though. Still, still producer, producer yes. Yep. So I did watch it to prep for and, this. Well, and, and he shot it and he edited it. Yes, he oh, did. <laughs> yes. It's not like well, he didn't. No, he, he didn't have Peter, hand Peter on Andrews it. the second one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, you did. I yeah, didn't know that. You shot that one, so I, which I didn't know. I just, I think when it, XXL came out, there's the title. It's a different director. I was like, uh, it's the studio trying to just, you know, cash in on this franchise. Mm -hmm. But I really, really enjoyed it because whereas the first one was this interesting study of a, a a character, this was like a buddy road trip with XXL, and it's it was as JJ said something completely different, and I really, really enjoyed that. So coming into the third one. I thought, oh, I'm on board for this this franchise. So am I a huge fan? No, but they are more enjoyable than I thought that I was expecting them to be. Okay, Tom, your Magic Mike's origin story. Yes, um, I think I watched the first one for two reasons. Of course, Steven Soderbergh, but also I was like, Channing Tatum, he can't hold a movie. That's like asking <laughs> someone bad to hold a movie and i remember just being blown away by how charismatic he is how talented he is he is just a straight up star for me even though they're doing very different things he's what i feel like i don't have that kind of response to like the rock Dwayne Johnson or anything like that. I just find him to be like pleasant and game whereas Channing Tatum is like legitimately funny and so funny in things like the other, uh, not the other guys, 21 Jump Street, stuff oh, like that. So, yeah. And he's such true. an amazing dancer. I loved the first one so much. The second one, it's interesting that, because uh, that kind of weirds out my original point, which was I really noticed Steven Soderbergh not there in the second one. So many things apart from the performances felt so flat to me. Um, Felt very forced, felt very just a lot of more camera just sitting there. Now I don't know what that means now that I know that Steven Soderbergh filmed it. Potentially, that was a preconception going in. If I was like maybe subconsciously like, oh, it's another director and he's never really done anything that big sense that I was probably like, eh, and let that sort of go. Yeah, I also yeah. got very uncomfortable with some of the performances in Magic Mike's XXL. But either way, I was so happy uh, to see this one because to see last dance because i liked the basic idea of it and the the end i'm keeping my tearaway <laughs> pants on yeah, now, okay right? I guess, keep those yeah. on i don't yeah. need to see the thong yet so yeah. i i am with you i uh the one of the things that i really uh, love about magic mike and and what it does is just how bold channing tatum is personally as a performer yeah. in putting this story on screen because in magic mike it is Pettifer's character that is Channing Tatum mm -hmm. in real life, right? He was the stripper when he was 18, 19, working a roofing job, getting the, the gig to become a stripper. And a, according to his uh, an interview he did, he, the very first thing he had to do was, uh, was uh, you know, they, they apparently haze each other by making each other do dances in different, like, you know, firemen and policemen, and they do all the things. And his was a Boy Scout. His very first dance was Ew. a Boy Scout. Probably. And um, and it was a very creepy song that he had to do it to. I can't remember it right off the top of my That's head. That's so I, creepy. I've been Have you seen any day. footage? Is there a way? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and he was so, like, that as a part of his life is... Uh, like, I think it's a bold choice to make a movie like this and for hmm. Soderbergh to be behind it, knowing that Soderbergh has his, you know, he he he's he's unafraid to make movies about some, you know, taboo subject matter. I wasn't it Soderbergh. Didn't he do the girlfriend experience? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. yes yeah. yeah. So so it's, this is like him balancing the scales. Right. In terms of gender equality. And, uh, you know, we're going to make a movie about prostitution. We're going to make a movie about male strippers. It's fine. Every, everybody. The universe is balanced. 
I loved the first Magic Mike. That movie had no business. It, it's like a razor's edge from being a ridiculously stupid movie to being something with enormous heart. And it had enormous heart. And Magic Mike XXL was pitch perfect, but with male strippers. It's like the ultimate sort of mindless road trip movie. Everybody's got to get to nationals, right? Like it just felt like that kind of a thing. <laughs> Regional, and yeah. I thought <laughs> this whole movie was so dumb, but all of them in a bus together, in that food truck together, mm -hmm. uh, having the experience of Tarzan and Tito and Ken and, and Richie all, all trying to like figure out what masculinity <laughs> is in friendships. And then the stunning big performance at the end, that mirror performance where they're doing their yeah. thing opposite each other With on the Twitch. frame on stage yeah. was wow. extraordinary. That yes. was extraordinary. Yeah. I was so moved by that. And then I thought, oh, oh, right. This is what it feels like to have body image issues. <laughs> well, and, and the other thing is you're also leaving out some of the stuff along the way, right? I mean, the whole yeah. scene with like Andy McDowell yeah. and like mm -hmm. relating yes. to aging and marriage and all, like they're doing this great, it's this great overall story. I love the, the Pitch Perfect comparison because I, mm -hmm. I agree. And then there's so many amazing performances and all these great little sub stories in it too with Jada Pinkett Smith and Andy McDowell and then you get Elizabeth Smart at the end. It's just all these great things and it's loaded with, it's like a, it, it's, it's like an amazing ice cream scoop with tons of great, crunchy, wonderful flavors in it. And that, and I thought XS, XXL was great for those reasons. And I was super impressed with it. I laughed a lot. So I, I think that takes us to a central question leading into this movie. Yeah. I don't believe anybody else. I think Channing Tatum is Magic Mike. And Magic Mike is Channing Tatum. Absolutely. And those two movies, the last two movies, proved that for me. Going into this movie, I wondered if there can be a Magic Mike movie without Magic Mike and Tarzan and Tito and Ken and mm -hmm. Richie. <laughs> Would the movie hold up without the core group that made up this sort of um, gr like band of masculinity seeking, um, you know, toxicity avoiding and yet sexual guys trying to figure out the world together? And so I ask you, did the movie stand up to that test? No, <laughs> for me, unfortunately, <laughs> no, I don't. I'm of of two minds about this movie. I like that it knows for the most part what we're there for. And I have trouble understanding why so much of it is not that. When it's that, it hits. When it's not, it doesn't. It robs us. It puts so much pressure really just on Channing Tatum. Yes. As far as charisma, as far as wit, as far as everything, I personally found, and this is just, I didn't find any chemistry except for the beginning dance between him and uh, Salma Hayek. Salma Hayek P Penalt. Yeah. What's Penalt, her last name? Right. Penalt. Yep, her new um, last name. The dance was outstanding in the beginning. The problem for me is the movie peaked early, then it went on for a while, then there was the bus scene. And then it went on for a while. And then the <laughs> final show. And that went on for a while was bereft. What it was missing was the himbos. It was missing people to interact with that had actual backstories and different personalities. We got to see them in a Zoom. That does not count. So no. for me, it was just sort of we were just adrift in London for me. Yeah. When JJ, it worked, it really worked. JJ, when Tom said no, your head went sideways on our recording. Why did it About go chemistry. sideways? Well, About I think, well, my thing in, in, in for the movie is I, I, I completely agree with that they sort of let go. I was, I'd say let go, that they released really the, the content of what is a Magic Mike movie. But I think in answer to your question, I don't think I was particular. I don't think I needed the himbos. It, and and what I mean is that specific group of himbos to make it a Magic Mike movie. I think that if Channing Tatum was the focus of this one it would have been fine and i actually didn't expect to see the other guys i was mad about the zoom because it was relatively unnecessary it was just totally something inserted so i would have liked to have seen more dancing and so I, I agree with tom on that part but the thing that bothered me most about about the magic mike character in this movie was that he he actually seemed somewhat irrelevant too this wasn't mm. that much about mike's 
journey. It wasn't much about Mike's life. All the details about Mike here were were sort of like, we went and got him because he's going to come and revitalize this other story. And I don't dislike this other story. I think there's, you know, the the part about changing theater for women's empowerment and 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 really the Selma Hayek character finding freedom and getting released. That stuff is an interesting story, but this is the Magic Mike franchise and we miss the dancing and there re- we really kind of missed a lot of Mike Lane in this story, unfortunately. So, um, yeah, so my feelings about it is that, yes, it was a Magic Mike story, but it's different, again, different than the first two. And I, I was, I was again, wildly entertained by the stuff that I like about him, but I, I felt like it was an unnecessary love story. I felt like there was a lot of really weird stuff that really didn't need to be in the movie um, mm-hmm. for us to enjoy what we were watching. Yeah, I, Steve, your take on the on what the Selma Herrick, uh, Selma Herrick, Selma Hayek character was doing to uh lift the story up i i'm i was struggling to figure out are we trying to recapture the sequence from xxl with andy mcdowell and make it a whole movie no uh no it didn't play no no it's this is a steven soderbergh film and as i watched this (laughs) i i watched this and there were several sequences where i went oh we're combining step up and oceans 11 this is what we're doing because right. if you look at there's the a whole, whole heist part, there's a whole yeah. heist part. Yeah. There's, as I've thought about it, Salma Hayek is Danny Ocean. Channing Tatum is is the Brad Pitt Rusty character who's sort of the sidekick to help bring this vision through because it's really about, you know, what what's her name, uh, Max, Max 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 Sandra, Max Sandra right? It's all about her trying to pull off this big show. And Mike is there as this sidekick to help her do that. So there's that aspect of it. The other part that, and maybe my theater had this and yours didn't, I don't know. Before the movie started, there was a little short piece that sort of did a whole recap of the first movie mm. and the second movie. And there was Shani no. Tatum. And he, he was in voiceover. He's saying, after Magic Mike XXL, they did, you can go to Vegas, wherever, see the Magic Mike show. There's a whole like okay. stage show. He said, and putting that show together was the genesis of the idea for another Magic Mike movie. Because as they had to put together a stage show, like, what is that about? That is where this movie came from. The seed for that story came out of that. So there was, so I thought, oh, okay, we're going to, it's all about creating the show. So I had that information going into it. I see Soderbergh pulling out his Ocean's Eleven bits and pieces. And for me, everything clicked along really, really well. There, did you also have the at the beginning, the Selma Hayek and Channing Tatum like, "Hey, w- thanks for coming to the movies to see our." No, no. what? Okay, none of that. Okay, so the there. You, know, you were too. you watching this movie at Channing Tatum's house? No, it was on the <laughs> Hark and Steve. It was on you the, said he wasn't going to go back. I there. know, but they, you know how they <laughs> always have those. Like, thank you for coming out, and all. The, it it was that type of thing, but it was. It wasn't that because wow. it's them. We got none just, of that. Channy Tatum starts talking. Salma comes and talks about how much fun she had doing this. They just I had bet. this great natural chemistry together. And then they just sort of like, you know, finish, uh, giggle and like walk off. And I was like, oh, this isn't the thanks, you know, for, you know, coming out and, you know, supporting Hollywood or all that. It was just this like little bit between the two of them so it established the chemistry between those two for me i, would like that. I had yeah i had maria menounos yes after yeah, that, so re- reminding me that popcorn exists yes. so <laughs> i need to tell you so uh, that we, well, we had nuvi but also in the ads yeah. the ads running up to the movie i don't know if you guys had this maybe you didn't yes. have this there was an ad for a strip club in Florida. In Florida. Yes. Had that. You saw it too. No. Okay, good. Yes. yes. Like yes. literally a male entertainer strip club yes. in Florida that was an ad, and they gave the website and said, said Come here to celebrate your special night. Yes. In which they're talking yeah. about bachelorette parties, these kind of things. Yeah. And the and I thought that was so what? great. I it was so it was so it was produced in a way that made me wonder if it was a gag. Yes. Like wondered if yeah. it was part of the film because it was mm-hmm. so like this kind of thing. But it's actually kind of just fun, smart marketing. That's way before it during the yes. movie stuff. I thought yeah. that yes. was great. Yeah. It's like a fathom events. Yes. Coyote. <laughs> right? <laughs> yes, exactly. So I had all of those things 
And so when I got into the story, everything worked really, really well. I felt like the chemistry, that scene where they're out to, they go out to the dinner with her friends and she's had a little bit too much to drink. And they had that scene in the car for me worked really, really well about this, what she set up, so how she's behaving. For me, that just rang really, it felt really natural. There was something about that I, I appreciate about Soderbergh is there's that either improv improvisational nature to how he shoots or whatever that just takes people's guard down and they're just humans with each other. And I saw, like, mm -hmm. I felt a lot of that between the two. That's just my take. I think that's, I think that's really interesting, Steve, mm -hmm. because I, and I, and I, I, I don't think, I think given that experience, I don't think we can understate how important that bit of like table setting was mm -hmm. for you because I didn't have it and did not have that same experience with their charisma. Mm. I, I think your your setup of having this as as some combination of Step Up and and Ocean's Eleven is really good, except for it's not enough Step Up, and it's absolutely not enough yeah. Ocean's Eleven. Like, <laughs> agreed. We have these ten guys standing on stage that are automatons. Like the they have no personality at all they're given nothing to yeah. work with we get a little bit of the former star uh, and let, let's just say you know we've we've been prattling on about this that the story of magic mike uh, oh. uh his last dance mike is broke his business uh, making found object furniture was taken under by the pandemic uh so he's broken in debt to his former stage mates so he follows the road to london with a wealthy maxandra to take this dusty old classic play and turn it into something to shake britain's britches <laughs> uh, that's pretty good right yeah i spent like an hour on that <clears throat> i'm sorry chat, G chat chat gtp wrote that so <laughs> great I I feel like his we have a little bit of Isabel the Isabel character in in the original play that they tear down in order yeah. to make this strip show she gets to be in the show with all these men who have no character they just dance um she gets a little bit we have this addition of the ballerina which was a late addition and made one of the most brilliant set pieces dance mm. pieces in the entire show i yep. adored it uh followed by the uh amazing uh dance sequence hey where did all the water go <laughs> with all the guys you remember uh, he did say get me a plumber he got a great plumber <laughs> great plumber yes yeah so there were there were some real high points and i think those three right those those dance pieces and the bus sequence, bus sequence uh, where for me they was were my favorite it was thing. extraordinary it was just wonderful and the way it was shot looking right in your eyes you know from her pov was really perfect so there was a lot of really good stuff going on here but when it didn't work it was channing tatum and salma hayek having no chemistry weird third wheel daughter who uh was the voiceover mm -hmm. to this so, so distracting why was I, there a I don't remember a single thing that she said and it was so distracting and it didn't yeah and it was trying to like put like a a funny, not a funny, no. uh, like a smarty pants bow. No, that's something that is not no. smarty pants. It's no, so no, bad. no. It was she was chronicling as as he's building the show. She's talking about the, is that or, book? or no, it's a it's it, well possibly, but I think yeah. it's really just she's talking about dance. Like it's to give the audience how how dance is part of culture. It started off as you know ways of communicating. You know all of those pieces. So. For me, it was sort of paralleling the development of the show by looking at how does dance function in our culture? What does it do? How do you know what is its role and how we interact with each other? And to me, it was a commentary on that mm -hmm. as the show he's putting on is deconstructing, you know, the this old, you know, crummy play. But I it didn't it. really I deconstruct just... the old Crummy play that much. No. And it wasn't, uh, there was, there's lofty <laughs> ideas behind this thing yeah. that never showed up. That's why my biggest complaint about the movie is it, fe it feels more like a sketch of a plot than a plot. Yes. I don't really believe any single part of it. I don't believe right. the love relationship. I don't believe that he knows how to direct a show. I don't believe that she knows how to produce a show. And I don't believe that they pulled it off. But we were yeah. told it all through like montage and wow, 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 which is okay <laughs> because when it worked, it worked. Like I'm really not trying to be a fuddy dud about the movie overall, yeah. but it just to go way back. And I'm sorry that I'm interrupting, um, but I, I think it's a good time to do it is 
if I hadn't known that this was the same screenwriter that did the first two Magic Mikes, I would have had to assume this was an existing project that then they shoehorned and made into a Magic Mike. That's Mike's. certainly what it felt like to because me. Because the DNA is so different and it's trying to do different things. And then they're like, oh, right, dancing. <laughs> well, right. And that's, I mean, Steve, everything you say about the voiceover is true. That's what they're trying to do and sort of yeah. explain dance in the culture but it it in the franchise it doesn't actually really fit in so yeah. it, it, it is a different kind of movie which like i said in 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 the intro that's kind of what i liked about the first two so i get that they're doing it but it it really didn't make sense to me in the whole scheme of things i i, I the the voiceover took me out of the movie almost immediately um and and i just wanted to get back to more dancing this yeah. is this is the challenge that I had with it too. Is that first of all, I have grown to hate voiceover just in general. I hate oh. it. It is a, it's it to me. It's a cinematic sin and needs to be used so precisely for it to actually work uh, that I just prefer not to have it. And they had this line in the movie, which is, as you know, uh, very troublesome for me. Then I can claim I got. Magic Mike's Last Dance. Oh, you don't like it when they reference like the title? Oh my God. When they put the title in the movie, I just, I cannot stand it. Oh, agreed. Uh, agreed. So those those are two like weird. So the first one, the voiceover is like this auteur stamp. It's mm -hmm. like, we're going to try to make this, this like uh, this haughty film. We're doing it in London. We have a British accent behind it and it's going to be this soda brain kind of thing. And it did not play for me. I felt, found it really distracting because there was no context. And by the time we get to context, we have this little duo of the butler and the daughter. <laughs> I would love to hear you, uh, uh, anyone who wants to take it, dissect the role of the butler in this movie. Did, was he of any import to you on your watch? He's three different characters, and the movie seems to think that he's comic relief. <laughs> but he's three characters in one. He's the guy that knows everything. Yes. But he's also the guy that tries to say something and no one listens to him. Yes. And then he's also the father figure that wasn't there. So the interesting thing, right. Tommy, that second character that you're talking about is lots of characters in this movie. They do that to Mike multiple times. They do that to they lots do? of different. Yeah. Well, Selma Hayek in particular, her character oh, Hayek, sure. cuts people off when they are trying to help. When they are, when, or when she says, it's your idea. She did this at the dinner table, for example. Uh, she said, tell them what it's all about. And as soon as she oh, started talking stop, what it's stop, all stop. about, That's right. don't say anything more. Like yeah. this kind of thing. So there's a lot of that that doesn't make sense for their relationships in any of the relationships with the, the, the butler as well. It's, it's very confusing why, why he's there. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I, I it, it felt a lot like he was an Ocean's Eleven character to me, where, mm. you know, he has utility. But outside of that, he's not a, character steve what do you think i mean i feel yeah. like you you said some things about how you liked it and then i went and started a train of all the things you liked i didn't like what do you, no, no, I, mean, I, I have does any of this ring true no, no i have issues with this i mean there are parts that i really really enjoyed yeah no the the butler is problematic because i didn't understand because i thought oh he's he's the one that's been around since the beginning he's got insight into this relationship so when we're hearing things like oh you know, she's all first act because she never follows through on anything and all of this in the nature of the relationship is the friends are saying, oh, this is just a, a, a phase or whatever. She She's not really leaving him. I thought, oh, he's going to have some insight. He he did. You know, he right. Yeah, he's not that that character's potential isn't realized for whatever reason, because the story wasn't going in that direction. I, yeah. So I agree. He's he's problematic. I mean, he's there to put his hand in front of eyeballs. Right at the at the dance at the end. I mean, he's oh, you know I don't that don't guy. get him at all. I, yeah, I was doing backflips trying to make him into something. Whenever mm -hmm. he was doing those inscrutable yeah. looks in the back, I was yeah. like, he's going to be the foil. Right. He's giving yeah. secret information to the husband. Why the husband always knows when to sweep? Nope. No. No. It There's was just no. It was a needless cutaway. Really, yeah. With yeah. most it, of the stuff they used him for were completely yeah. useless. And, and yet, to anywhere. lean in on yeah. that point, Tom, like at some point, there, I mean, the daughter and the butler have a conversation about how the butler somehow left keys out for Mike to get into <laughs> yeah. the theater. Yeah. But we never saw that, yeah. right? No. Like that was just a tell. In every Magic Mike movie, there's some retconning, I believe. Mm -hmm. Some is very small, some is weirdly how was that not in the script like an xxl mm -hmm. when he's giving the girl like ending the mirror dance 
and very clearly it's eighty yard and looks like you found your smile again. He goes, Yes, thanks, Mike. <laughs> Neither of them said that. But it's also like, how did you not have that in the script? That was like a, right. a hanging thread. And that, so there's and, always and that girl, a, by the way, is Amber Heard. Just mm-hmm. there's yep. a, Yes. <laughs> to go into like the XXL. That's like, Amber Heard? Yes, right? that like, is Amber Heard. The cast in XXL is really interesting. Yes. When you yeah, think really about everything that's happened to those people since that movie, it's wow. Wild. Yeah. That's Amber Heard. Like, look at Elizabeth Smart's trajectory. Look yeah. at, you yeah. know, right. Natalie, Stephen Twitch Boss's trajectory, which yeah. just this year. And Amber Heard, I mean, it, it, Jada Pinkett Smith, the, the, that right. cast is wild when you look at yeah. all this stuff. But yeah, that that kind of stuff, that retconning, it, it's it it's done yeah. for some reason, but it's yeah. not really clear the reason why it <laughs> is put there for us. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we talked about uh, the the fact that this movie feels like it's written uh, from uh, by a, a different as a different project. All of these films uh, were credited as written by Reed Carolyn. Mm-hmm. Um, Reed is an is an often uh, you know uh, credited as a collaborator with uh, Channing Tatum. Oh, and, what else? What else did they do? Uh, dog, mm-hmm. uh, just oh. recently, the okay. Channing Tatum's Road Dog Road movie, um, and so like you know, that's that's for Logan Lucky, who's a producer on Logan Lucky, um, oh, 20, like... 21 and twenty two Jump Street, White House Down. Uh, oh like wow! He's, he's, so they really he's are been around on a, oh. a lot of projects, uh, whether from uh, as a writer or a uh, producer, and so that's that's great. Uh, good, good for them. Oh, Earth, Ray, Earth made of glass is another one that he did. I actually don't know that Tatum that was involved exist. in that one. I don't think he was involved okay. in that. Thanks, Tom. Uh, <laughs> so uh, this one did feel, this one did feel different. But I struggled with why it was different. I'm curious if you guys have any thoughts on just the script. To me, I'm listening to these people talk, particularly Tatum and and Hayek, and wondering. Is this a performative challenge that I'm feeling like they're the words they're saying they might like this might have been an animated project that they were in studios separately recording their dialogue separately without the benefit of acting together? That's kind of what it felt like to me. Like it was it was almost the two like leads. The, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, Selma Hayek and Channing Tatum. Like I really struggled with the way the words left their mouths, whether they were just poor words or poorly performed words. Hmm. Any, I mean, does that ring true for anyone? No, it does. Well, I just, what? Well, I don't think that <laughs> I'm bad. No, I don't think that I'm bad in saying this. I hope I'm not. But one of the problems for me with their chemistry is she just seemed like an extremely messy person mm-hmm. all the time. Mm-hmm. And then other people come in and they're like, she's always very messy. And he's like, yeah. But I see something. I see something in her, and we're like, "Why was all that off camera?" <laughs> did he? Yeah, but he didn't actually say that, did he? No. I don't think he said. I see. Well, see and that's he the said he loves her, but that's he didn't say that till the end. Yeah, I no, mean, and I didn't believe it, not even for a second. Exactly, and that's the thing. I mean, but the, the daughter said that to him, and he didn't disagree at the table uh, when the when during that one of the many inscrutable things about the butler was like, when he's mean to you, he likes you because he doesn't like you. What? All right. Anyways. Uh, but then she goes, why are you so something about you're so crazy about her? And he's like, <sighs> and I was like, well, when did this happen? Yeah. Yeah. It never yeah. happened. And, and, no, and, and, and but they just decided the, that he right. was madly in love with her. And I was like, why? <laughs> She's that, a that messy feels person. like one of the retcons, right? Yeah. Like it feels like one of the retcons. And I and I all I the wonder, retcons happened in that kitchen. I'm just wondering yeah, if you were to do one. one day of reshoots, you just <laughs> and you had light chick- that kitchen, kitchen and you do that's when you got keys <laughs> being handed off. That's when you got love <laughs> angles. One day, two two setups. <laughs> Yeah. That's a really good point. Steve, you're Sorry. nodding along. What do you think? And well, you're the one who saw the chemistry. No, no. I, I think it's there. I think I think the actors had chemistry with each other. There's there's issues with the relationship between, between the characters because from the beginning, she sets it up as, look, this is a strictly a professional working relationship. I'm bringing you out here because I see you're the right person to do this. Then we slowly, you know, as we get more and more, there's you know, about her and I agree how messy she is. And I'm like, dude, you don't want anything to do with this mess because you don't know what's what's coming ever around the corner with her. Um, that it starts to transform to 
as she's talking about the show, she wants people in the audience to have that feeling that she had mm-hmm. in that first dance. And I thought, okay, so, so what's going on with that? Is she trying to put barriers mm-hmm. up? You know, then, then she starts trying to put the moves on him. What's, what's going on. So unfortunately it, it's, Oh, this woman is, is erratic. And I, I don't, I have problems with that. Um, like, cause it allows them to just say, Oh, well, she's just messy. So she can act inconsistently and it's okay for that character i'm like well that doesn't excuse it we need to have what is she trying to accomplish and that's one of the struggles i have with this is the discussion they have at the beginning about the play and oh why is it always the women have to choose between the the you know true love or the wealthy guy you know all that which parallels her situation here like oh the 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 poor guy with the heart of gold mike lane or her wealthy husband why does she have to choose i'm like you're you told us we women should have a different story. And then you just gave us the exact same story. She's got to choose between these two guys. And that's one of the things yeah. that I really struggled with was you didn't give me a different story for her other than choosing between true love and being with the poor guy or being with the wealthy guy. And so I feel like because her character hadn't crystallized as far as who she was and where she wanted to go, they couldn't really re- write a nice arc for her that was going to address that issue. Yeah, it's I think there's there's another uh, or just to I guess to add into that point that it it's not really a rags to riches story. It's a riches to rags story, too, yeah. that they didn't they didn't really hide. Like we all sort of knew. I, I hope we all sort of knew that that ticking time bomb was eventually going to go off as, you know, they set up the whole relationship with her, you know, former spouse's. Uh, mother mm-hmm. owning all of the property in yeah. the theater and this and that eventually all the money would revert back to the husband in their divorce and she would be poor tom well i was hoping that if there was more we're spending so much time on this thing that the joke or the ending would be it's a riches and love story mm-hmm. that yeah. for some reason she gets to go with the guy with the heart of gold and mm-hmm. all the crappy husband's money Mm-hmm. If he was yeah. crappier or if they found something right. way to do it, she gets everything. And then that's empowering. She didn't have to choose. Instead, they just went right down the line. Right. JJ, I yeah. think. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I understand what you guys are saying, but I also think they tried to subvert that by planting in Mike Lane's mind the fact that she was going to need to make the choice between riches and him. And then ultimately, she just never had a chance at riches. She had already left him and was trying to leave him the whole time. That, and that's what they tell. When they talk at dinner, the, her friends make it make him make Mike Lee Lane believe that she's just playing him. Right. And they never really hit on this part of the story enough that she's right. just playing. She's not him. completely breaking him up because then she's still she's staying has... with the rich guy. And that's what his concern is through much of the crises left in the movie but then they come around at the end the point that i want to make though is that the interesting thing about this love story which again i do believe is needless in this case i like this kind of love story so much better than and it's time for one of my titanic rants to come out where (laughs) where we have in titanic the you know jack and rose it's another riches to rag story, right? Jack is stalking Rose through much of the movie. And then eventually he plies her with alcohol. They have sex. And then they're actually truly in love, right? He paints her. They do all that stuff. And they're truly in love. That's what the arc of the Titanic story is. This arc is completely different. In that, plies her with alcohol. If, if You're you not want, wrong. But if, I know. Like this is, <laughs> I'm always he waiting for a chance. He plies her with alcohol. Makes her incredibly dizzy from that one dance. <laughs> And now and then throws her in, in a cab yes. on a boat in the back. So now in this story where, again, I think this is a needless story, but I want to give it credit for the fact that they have a romantic interlude at the beginning. And then they have the conversation in bed that says, we're not going to have a relationship. We're just going to have this working relationship. And then he does learn that she's messy and he lives with her messy and all of these things over time. And I don't truly believe it either, but I think the intent is a much better Mm -hmm. representation of the way that love stories should be told in Hollywood of it takes effort. It takes time. It takes choosing a partner. And that's what Mike versus like love is just finding the glass. Right. Exactly. And I, I believe that what they're trying to tell us is that Mike chose the mess, right? Mike chose the difficulty Mm -hmm. with her in it. I don't think they do a good job of telling that, but I'm so glad that they tried is kind of how I feel about it. Agreed. Yes. And I, yeah. So yeah, I believe that they can work together again mm-hmm. on another production. 
mm-hmm. <laughs> the, the characters. I don't believe that they're in love, but I believe that, right. you know, maybe yeah. they're choosing it. I mean, Mike, yeah. Mike has a different love interest in each Magic Mike movie. So, you know, sure right. does. So, so take your pick. I'm a, I still miss Brooke. I think that was a ah, horrible yeah. thing. That, yeah. was that fell apart. Yeah. Brooke was the best. Look, I me. did they need to go to London in this thing? Oh, like, no. uh, she's, no. she, Salma Hayek's from Mexico. He's, you know, Florida. Nope. Another needless thing. Yeah. Is and there- and it's, it's so tropey. Like, I just found myself like this was a real head slapper that Soderbergh would choose to do the travel to London montage and show all the stupidest, like, tourist stuff. That's so Soderbergh. Away. That's so Soderbergh, it's though. So, you're right. You know, you're right. I should have. I, I should not yes. have expected anything less. It's, <laughs> it's the ocean. It's the Ocean's Eleven piece of like, we're going someplace and boom, 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 boom. boom cuts to yeah. all the touristy stuff. I mean, yes. He really he gets does. off a, I, dub, I think, a double decker bus. Everyone's yeah. like, oh, yeah. they're so good. <laughs> Sipping tea with a tall hat yes. made of feathers. Yeah. Yeah. Or it's I, opera I glasses. Don't. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I uh I don't I, I didn't think it needed to go to London. I thought that was a that was sort of a cheap thing. And again, it goes back to what you guys said earlier, that this was a movie that was delivering different things from the DNA of the Magic Mike yes. franchise. They forgot what Magic Mike was. And I think in addition to getting rid of the core guys as the Magic Mike bus, uh, getting rid of weird. I cannot believe I'm saying this out loud. Getting rid of Florida is also a, a <laughs> interesting choice. Mm-hmm to the peril of Magic Mike. Like, he's a Tampa guy. <laughs> Miami, Tampa. Like, that's part of the <laughs> gestalt of Magic Mike. And I, I, let's just say that maybe, like, I have one credit for they should always leave this movie in the state of Florida. And I'm never going to say it again about Yikes. any other movie. Yep. Or well, the deep uh, south, at least, because Myrtle Beach is South Carolina. But you know. You're yeah. right. You're right. Yeah. Myrtle Beach carries the same vibe. That's right. <laughs> I will say that's where Jeez. it became more step up because it, it moved away from yeah. being strippers to really dancers. And that was the mm-hmm. the leap because that's the the dancing that happens here. I mean, that's I mean, that whole recruiting, you know, building the team montage of finding the best dancers in each of these different styles of, of dance told me this was going to be a different type of movie. You know, again, maybe it's because I'd been prefaced with that whole connection to the stage show they built that this was going to be really about dance not about dudes taking their clothes off they do get to the stripping part but to me it was the focus was on the dance and to me that justified right. they kept their pants on yeah mostly this time. yes that, that That's justified big, the move yeah. to to london you know that that gave me <laughs> I'm like okay because they can pull in from everywhere in europe they so I agree. I, I agree oh, with you, Steve. And then then why do they say they make the big stripper chant before they go on stage? Because they're not actually stripping. It's really just a dance review. So like that, again, they're they're really wanting to try to tap into that Magic Mike DNA. But it's a different movie. Yeah, it's a different different kind of thing The 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 parts that were Magic Mike were very enjoyable and they just yep. needed a lot more of them. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, they did. Although here's a just as a final point, I never again, and the thing I I wouldn't have expected to say about it, uh, that I don't I don't know that there was enough stripping in this movie to that point. Like part of what makes the movie titillating is confronting subjects, the people they are stripping for, with the sort of full a, a full throated attempt at the at at challenging cultural norms like that's why stripping is titillating in the first place is to see naked people out of context in front of you and you are not naked that's what stripping (laughs) is all about like that's the cultural thing right and and the first two movies i think did a a pretty good job of that the first one in particular because it lives inside the club the second one less so because it was performative for other performers and for like the whole we gotta go to regionals thing is but is, then it really uh, was, increased the diversity yes is it, what right. the second really one was doing with age um mm-hmm. different nationalities yeah yeah race, i think this is another one that doesn't lean in maybe heavily enough on what makes magic mike titillating is that there there was less stripping it was more dancing and i love the dancing the dancing was great and uh and also more stripping in the dancing for a magic mike movie i'm curious steve you are among us you're the the 
<laughs> the first stripper out you're of all the of dance. You're the although dance you, dad. Yeah. Although I, I was about to say stripper dad, and I would regret that. So it's out there. You're the dance dad. Like, yeah. how did this? How does this hold up to your like experience of dance culture? Wait, did why dancers, are we saying the words dance dad? Because I don't know. I got, Steve I've has got daughters who dance. Yes, I have a dancer in the fam. So mm -hmm. got yes. it. Your so yeah, so actually, so my youngest daughter. was actually oh oh geez, I don't know how many years ago was at a dance convention, um, and took a class led by Stephen Twitch Boss, and my wife was oh. there and actually got to talk with his mom and grandmother who were there. Uh, wow. This was just shortly after, so you think you can dance and everything, and you know, so yeah, that, well, that's where I know him. That now. loss uh, earlier this year, it, it was something. Because I didn't pay attention to cast, I thought, "Oh, is he going to be in this?" Because I don't. That's going to be really right. rough um, for yeah. me. Oof. But um, it would be for me too. Yeah. But that, Pete, to your question, I saw a lot of like the step up stuff in this, and the types of dances, like the suits dance, the even the even the water dance. That was something I think in Step Up to the Streets or Step Up Three, where there was a lot of water used. And so, yes, it, mm -hmm. it's different when you're out in the streets with the water. Where, how do you drain all of that? But just the choreography, the the powerful, I have to say that last dance as they're cutting to Salma Hayek and the story that he's telling in that dance uh, was so powerful. I had not seen anything that moved me that much in other dance movies. Um, so I think it's done really, really well. For me, there is enough stripping because you got the three ladies in the chairs that got, got to have guys grinding on them. We've got a couple other... Got a couple other dance numbers where it's guys taking their shirts off and all of that. But to me, it, I when I finished this movie, I, I called home and said, hey, this has less. This is more of a step up movie than a Magic Mike movie. There's, there's yeah. less stripping, more dancing to me, much more comfortable to sit and watch with my family. Um, this one, I have to say, going into the theater uh, by myself, uh, sitting by myself, surrounded by That's women was real. Was real, real <laughs> Real interesting, and the fact that I uh, hadn't eaten I, dinner. I got a few teehees. Yeah. Oh no, but the fact that I hadn't eaten, so I got a hot dog, and so I'm sitting there surrounded by women <laughs> eating a hot dog, watching men take their shirts off, made me feel just a bit uncomfortable. <laughs> but I do have to say, I saw this in Atmos, and the, <laughs> no, no, the sound design. When we get to that section where it is just the show, I felt. Yeah. I was there because the sound, the mm -hmm. cheering, the clap, everything. I thought it's not a completely packed theater and there are lots of women here who are cheering, but it really filled and made me feel like for yep. that dance, I was there in the show watching that because it was just, I was like, how are we going to end this? Oh, we're going to get a straight, whatever, 25 minutes of the dance show. And so just consistent dance number after dance number um, for me, just, yeah, that was what made me really, really enjoy this movie is that strong amount of dance and done really, really well with, with various dancers with their different styles of dance and how that was all worked together in there was, yeah, really enjoyable for me. I would watch that section of the movie. I would watch that last part over and over again. Easily. For sure. Yeah. For sure. That in the bus. I, I want to see the bus. In the bus. Sequence. Yeah. In the bus. Right now. Oh, yes. Yeah. I want to see the bus sequence. That was the absolute highlight. That in the beginning dance. Mm-hmm. Between Duda oh, the, and, yeah. and, 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 and the yeah. house, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that yeah. that I beginning say. piece, because I this was something I wondered like, how do we connect this? Because I'd seen in the in the previews, everybody's seen in the trailer, like, oh, don't I know you? Weren't you a cop? And I was like, oh, that's a nice little callback to the first. But the way that was connected in the story, yeah, of like, because I'm like, what reason does she have? Oh, oh, Kim who was a college student when Mike was a cop in right. that first movie is now her attorney. And that gives that, I was like, this is really smart, smart writing to connect these pieces, to give Mike a reason mm -hmm. to do this. Cause I thought, what's, what's his reason for getting back into dance? What is this? And the way he, that was written to pull him in, I thought was really smart. And I really enjoyed that way to kick this thing off because I thought, He's lost his business. He's bartending. How is he ending up in London, you know, running a dance show? And I thought that was such a nice callback to the first one. And agreed. Yeah, I uh, I, I think you're really I, I think you really nail it. I think so much of this movie uh, sits on the back firmly on the back of Channing Tatum's extraordinary charisma. Um, I, I have nothing 
nothing I thought you were going to talk about his extraordinary back. But, yeah. <laughs> he also has an extraordinary back. Yes. He's extraordinary. He's a specimen. He is an absolute specimen, this, this Channing Tatum. Uh, and, and I, but I, I think that this movie for me, just in, as we kind of get toward wrapping up, this movie for me swings much more widely than the, uh, than the last two in the stuff that just doesn't work at all to the stuff that, that really does and is really filmed and produced beautifully that just looks good uh, with exception of the, the, you know, the major dance numbers that we've already said are, are fantastic. Fantastic. Do you have any specific thoughts about the presentation of the thing, camera, the the way, you know, Soderbergh works the frame, JJ? Well, that handheld scene where when they that leads up to what becomes the dance, right, where he's saying goodbye to her and she's exiting the theater and then they stay with him handheld. They walk around, they they follow Selma Hayek and then they come back to him looking up at him with the theater in the background. It's very confusing. <laughs> There's it, it, it's not a very tightly controlled handheld shot and it's very loose. It doesn't really seem to make sense. Uh, I guess other than to literally draw your attention to the fact that this is happening in real mm -hmm. life now, because later on, it's going to be the centerpiece of our of mm -hmm. our show. But at the moment, it really took me out of things because I was like, what are you trying to show here? It was very confusing for the emotion that was going on, because, again, that sort of thing of, oh, he's he has fallen in love with her, but we never saw that on screen. So that mm -hmm. whole like going away thing was very, very confusing to me. Um, but uh, all of the camera was really meant to be showing us something. I just got confused at what those things were from time to time based on their choices. Hmm. Tom? Uh, for me, two things. There was way too many um, stop, stop, stop the musics. <laughs> uh, that's that's that can be that's just got to be lazy screenwriting at some point of like going into a number mm -hmm. and then someone storming in from back from off screen saying stuff like this. I mean, it happened like four different times. That's a, that's obscene. Uh, but who cares? And then the other one, <laughs> you guys had the cat intermission, right? Yes. What was that? Yes. 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 What was yeah. that? <laughs> what was <laughs> it? <laughs> what was it? I, don't... I mean, Soderbergh's such a weirdo. And that goes back to like his <laughs> schizopolis stuff of like, he's just has a playground sometimes, but what was that? It was so, it almost, Something like that can really be a home run for me because it's like, go for it. This felt rude. And that's a weird way to say it. But I was like, <laughs> did you just not have any kind of transition to get to her up there? Did you forget to film something like that was just insane? Was there any kind of a connection in the script that I missed? I no a puppy. No, that's no. the only I, thing. A guy I, was I, holding a puppy. I what literally, was that? Yeah, no, I literally thought it was. I wasn't sure if it was me. I mean, watching it, you know, it, it's very confusing. <laughs> I, I I just took that as it's I have, not allowed. I'd have to watch it again if that was because we're going to the theater and seeing a show and mm -hmm. shows have intermissions. Was that to signify that, oh, we've gotten this far into the show. There's an intermission that the audience is actually experiencing. But I'm not going to show you that because oh. you know what an intermission is. And, I, you know, why would I film people like. Oh, getting up from their seats and talking and then coming back and resuming the show. It's just like it just moves time, moves time forward. That's how very I took quickly. it. I don't know that it worked but as that's well. An insane but, way to but it was. I mean, everybody <laughs> busted up laughing at that, and I thought it it did its purpose. If it's there to make us think about it, remember it because it definitely stands out. I don't know if this is a thing, but I as we're talking about it, I literally looked up <laughs> cat intermission magic mic. And the first YouTube result that comes up is Magic Mike XXL, parenthetical, the cute kitten edition. What? I'm, it's not. <laughs> I'm telling you. What? What does that mean? What is there, it? Can you say it? Can it, you see what it is without? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a joke video on YouTube. Is it cats playing cats Magic Mike? Cats acting like they're being Magic Mike XXL. So I'm just... There's a wild hypothesis. Just going to throw it out there. Maybe he's referring to something that was created How many about views? an earlier film. Oh, that's I didn't click on it. I get nervous. If it's a if it's a whirlwind <laughs> oh, goodness, success, no, viral yeah. success. It's of course playing, and we didn't want it to play, but it's 
Uh, views, 100,000 views. That's not a lot. That's not. So I don't, I don't think so. Okay. No. I don't know, but that's the first thing that comes up <laughs> when you look up cat intermission magic Mike is magic Mac XXL cute kitten, cute kitten, edition. kitten edition. I was hoping that all three of us had the cat and Steve did it. <laughs> that Steve has all this weird sh- stuff before right. the movie and we have right. this bizarre thing in the middle of the movie. It's like, what's happening, AMC <laughs> or wherever we saw it. Right. Uh, love it. Oh yeah. dear! Now it's just Soderbergh well, being Soderbergh and giving us all the all the things. I mean, that's I guess. And yeah. I've said many times on this podcast that I love novelty, right? Yeah. And when and, yeah. and yeah. Andy's asked me from time to time, he said, "Well, what do you mean by novelty?" And that's the kind of mm-hmm. stuff that I find to be novel in film, where you don't really necessarily know what it's in. It's a card that's just dropped in. It may have a reason. It may not. It gives you the uh, uh, the ability to figure it out for yourself. This one felt really far out of place. I'm going to give it. That. I'm going to say that. But I like that kind of stuff when it's it's a to- it's a handoff to something. It, it, you don't just put it in there for no reason. There right. is a reason why I'm it sure. exists. We just don't know what that reason. Is. You know what it reminds me of? Very different movies, obviously, but in Death Proof, part of mm. the Grindhouse yeah. movies, mm-hmm. the one that uh, Tarantino directed. There's a whole frame missing part when she starts to do the lap dance for Kurt Russell. Mm -hmm. And there's Mm -hmm. a whole frames missing thing. It goes, and then the movie starts again. They filmed all of it. And it's in the special features when you buy the DVD or have the Mm. special features. Maybe there was just something that he really liked, but they had to take it out because the movie is already almost too long. Two mm-hmm. hours for mm-hmm. four great sequences is too long for me. Maybe yeah. he's doing one of those of like, hey, everybody, something's happening here and you will all find out later. I don't know. Sure. It's interesting. Sure. Yeah. That is interesting. Well, it's it's tip it's Soderbergian yeah. for yep. sure. Yes, because he's a weirdo. He's Love a it. he's a weirdo. <laughs> he's but my I'm generally kind of weirdo. in the bag for for Soderbergh. And I yep. think I my hunch is this movie uh might just age better than the first watch did if only mm. anchored by those big pieces sure uh because now i know what i'm looking forward to on a second watch i'm gonna watch it for those big dance numbers and uh less so much for the vapid emptiness of the the actual <laughs> characters that have been written devoid of all personality and motivation well Unlike that one dancer Soderberg had a, other a real, movies that one dancer had a real big beard so <laughs> what more do you what more do you need to know? right yeah. up you're yeah. so right yeah his, uh, his his uh his dancing his stage name was actually bobby bigbeard so <laughs> bobby bigbeard jj's confused that and was my bobby dancing is name. actually what's in quotes yeah um uh, yeah i think I, I unless you have any other points i think we need to move on to talking about how we are going to rank it yeah all right, I'm Letterbox. Good. You know what Letterbox is. Letterbox is our favorite social media network for movie lovers, uh, and uh, you can be a part of Letterbox too if you fall in love with it, just like we have. Uh, then y- you can head over there and and support Letterbox and this show by using the code NextReel at checkout, and you can upgrade to a pro or patron membership yourself by s- and save twenty percent along the way. Fantastic Kiwi team. You know, Andy has been to Auckland and met with the guys who run this thing. I didn't like know he, that. we've actually what? we've had right. boots on the ground in New Zealand at Letterbox headquarters. That's how much we love Letterbox. Uh they're fantastic, great supporters and we're happy to be partner with them. So head over there and if you really want a quick and easy way to just head over to the nextreel.com slash letterbox and you can uh, it'll take you right over there to the checkout page where the code is already applied. So bully for you. All right. How are we going to do this? Uh, JJ, where do you start? I am nervous that I'm going to skew this in the positive direction because I just love the franchise so much. I mean, that's what I kind of tried to talk about in my intro. Mm -hmm. I didn't laugh, cry nearly as much as I did in XXL in enjoyment, but I still did in this movie. So it is on the positive side for me. I give it a three stars and a heart because I would want to watch any of these three movies anytime just to see the fun dancing and those sequences. So I think your point about it possibly... um, aging up better for us i think is 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 true and um in connection with those others i'm i'm all about it so i give it a three stars i I, do you have right off the dome what you would give magic mike and xxl 
I would comparison. give them both at least four, maybe a 4.5 for those two. I bet, well, okay. especially for the first one, because the first one surprised me so much yeah. about, yeah. and it, it, in, in, in the realm of Soderbergh movies, like it's, it's a fantastic Soderbergh movie. This one feels like it's a little bit less so, but it's still enjoyable. So I think yeah. I'd probably say 4.5 for the first one, four for XXL and, uh, and three for this one. Okay. Steve. Yes. I give it a high. How, how do you I give it? Rate it I, Steve. I give. Are you here? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Today we're talking about Magic <laughs> Mike's <laughs> Last Dance. Steve just rebooted. <laughs> I give it. Uh, so okay. So I give this one a heart. And I recently watched Magic Mike and Magic Mike XXL, and was tr- contemplating where this one fell. Because Pete, you're absolutely right. XXL is like pitch perfect two or whatever that one came in at three stars for me. the first one i remember liking a lot on our second watch it just didn't seem as solid for me and like i said i think it's the dual protagonist issue and it's, it's clunky so that one was at three stars for me and i was ready to give this one three stars but that the as i was sitting halfway through this i'm like yeah this is okay probably three stars but i'm moving it up to three and a half just on that whole last the show just everything mm-hmm. the power of all of that uh so I'm I'm going with three and a half and a heart. All right. Okay. All right, Tom. Yeah, I'll give it a heart. It's too much of a sketch of a movie. <laughs> Just a heart? <laughs> Just a heart. No numbers. No. I'll give it a heart. And um I can't give it personally any higher than a three. Uh, because it's just too much of a sketch of a movie and there's too many weird things that didn't work for me. But I will rewatch this whole movie at some point. But I'm happy to give it at the very least a three because I really look forward to fast forwarding through this movie <laughs> to certain points, which blew me away. And when I catch myself alone in a theater, well, not alone, but I, I didn't go with anyone else, slightly bouncing up and down and smiling, which is a performative yeah. thing. But when you find yourself, oh, I'm doing that just because I'm feeling something so deep, I could never give it anything less than a three. So I'm going to give three and say that it might go up to like a 3.5 at some point. But right now, three and a heart sounds good. And you were, where were you on the first two? Four, 3.5. Four, 3.53. So we're descending. Okay. I, uh, um, 4.5. 3.53. 4.5, 3.53. 4. 5, 3. Okay. All right. All right, for the the record, Four points. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> noted. Uh, I I I love that you talked about seeing the movie alone and like bouncing. I, <laughs> I realized when I walked out of the movie that that was sort of my experience too. That I feel like I watched all those dance scenes with like my butt clenched, right? <laughs> like I was like, oh, like tight. I was all tight, <laughs> as if I was there. And then I checked my abs and. <laughs> Stop thinking about that. Um, Wait, in that situation, were you in the audience or one of the dancers? Yeah, I was the, audience, the I was in the audience watching it, and oh. then I was uh, oh yeah in the movie. I thought you meant did I get up and like no. Rocky Horror this thing? <laughs> no, I mean when you were were you tight butted because you were identifying imagining with the myself dancers. as a dancer? Yeah, I was dancing. Yeah, nice. can't, can't you see it? Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. So. Um, Anyhow, I uh, I think that the first two movies are four star for me uh, for very different reasons, weirdly, and hearts. Um, and this one, I think I'm going to go for a three. I was actually tempted before we started this conversation to go for a two star and a heart for this one and, and oh. put it more in the realm of guilty pleasure. But honestly, Steve's enthusiasm for <laughs> for the the depth of the movie that I, and their chemistry that I didn't see has actually provoked me to lift okay. it a star. I think that's uh, I'm, I'm going to see that again. And, and uh, Edna Eaglebauer oh, yes. uh, is, is, was Edna. worth it. I did love the hot seat bit. That was great. That Using was the the old, older women, the more clearly British restrained uh, women in in that scene, I I thought was really great. I so liked it too. four four three, uh, three stars in a heart for this one, and and uh, I'm glad for it. Now, what comes next? I'm so glad you asked. We yeah. uh, deliberated. We deliberated Ugh. heartily. Don't get us started. Oh, it was big. But we are going to come back next month. The film board will gather to talk about Scream 6. Woo! We're going to Manhattan. 
Scream Goes Manhattan. Uh, we're very excited to take uh, that a look at that film. We have talked about uh, all the other Scream films, uh, Scream films on the next reel, and so uh, I'm sure Andy will not care for the fact that we're breaking up the set. We'll probably do a show on it anyway. Nice. Who knows? Uh, so I'm uh, I'm excited to talk about that. That comes out. What did we say? The tenth, eleventh, twelfth. Yep. Yeah. So we're it'll be the week 12th. of the twelfth. We're gonna the the show will be out. So uh, be on the lookout for recording there in Discord. Don't forget, you can hang out in our online community, uh, thenextreel.com slash Discord. It'll whisk you over to the invitation page where you can accept that and join the public community. But really, if you want to uh, if you want to do more, if you want to support the show and, and help us out, you can join, become a member at uh, truestory.fm slash TNR dash membership. I think we have that routed. Thenextreel.com slash membership will get you there too. Anyway, you sign up on the website and you become a supporter uh, of the show and it helps us uh, continue to do what we do and grow the show and invest time and attention and energy to doing more shows about movies. We sure appreciate you uh, being a part of this community. Uh, and it also gives you access to all the super secret channels in Discord, which is oh, really fun. So and don't forget, you can join the live stream as a member. You can actually watch us record this show live and chat along with us uh, as we record. We love when that happens. So... Thank you, everybody. And really, thank you, thugs. JJ, oh. great to see you. Thanks for having me. Uh, Tommy, uh, always a treat. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> <laughs> and Steve. Oh, my abs are sore. Or my, my, my <laughs> lack of abs is sore after watching this movie. <laughs> and my butt. I mean, I will catch you next month right here on the Fillboard. Board.